Hello there. I'm afraid I'm unable to attend the meeting in person, so I've recorded this talk on the topic of democracy or oligarchy for the conference. Now, we have to ask what we mean by democracy. What is the United States, for example? Uh, it's claimed to be a democracy, but is it really a democracy? Um, we have the whole ceremonial that presents it as such, but is that a, a justified claim? A growing number of uh, political scientists argue that the political system in the USA is not a democracy, it's an oligarchy. Uh, these are just a few of the, the news reports and a prominent book by Winters on the topic that have come out in the last uh, while. So people are asking in the New York Times, is you, you, America not oligarchy? There are summaries of r reports here. Um, Martin Gillens of Princeton and Benjamin Page of Northwestern have found that the preferences of rich people had a much bigger impact on subsequent policy decisions than the views of middle income and poor Americans. Indeed, the opinions of lower income groups and of interest groups that represent them appear to have no li or little or no independent impact on policy, they say. And this is from leading researchers in the US. Uh, continuing summaries of this, their report. Uh, things which point to an oligarchy are that in practice, the views of the of those not in the elite have little or no impact on public policy. For instance, they say a proposed policy change with low support among economically elite Americans is adopted only 18% of the time, while a proposed support with high, a proposed change with high support is adopted about 45% of the time. So that's clear influence on the elite classes on policy. In contrast, they say, when a majority of citizens disagree with the economic elites and with organised interests, they generally lose. Moreover, because of the strong status quo bias built into the US political system, even when fairly large majorities of Americans favour policy change, they don't get it. The second big pointer to the US being an oligarchy in government and the legislature are socially very unrepresentative of the US population. Here's a tabulation of US congressmen and senators by worth, or congressmen and women and senators by worth, and we can see that a number of them are extremely wealthy indeed, 500 million for the, the wealthiest senator. Uh, the prominent Democrat senator from California had 58 million. These are, are not representative of the general population. Uh, the top 50 members of Congress ha had more than 7.5 million each. There were 157 uh, members of Congress who had between 1 and 10 million. There were 155 members of Congress which had 100k to between 100k and 1 million. Now that doesn't sound much until you start looking at how much did the general, well that may not sound much, until you look at how much the, the general population in the US had. The median American household has only 4,000 uh, 4, in savings. If you add in retirement savings, the median US household has 11,000. And if you look at uh, black households, the median net worth was 9,000. So that you can see that the position of the average congressman at half a million is way above the general population. Now, why are they so unrepresentative? The US has got elections. Doesn't it therefore have a representative democracy? 
Well, we know that actually Congress is very unrepresentative of the population. It's unrepresentative in terms of the legislation it passed and it's unrepresentative in terms of social composition. So why is this? If, if you go right back to ancient political theory, you get Aristotle saying that there are two key principles of democracy. One of them is you have a sovereign assembly of citizens which decides major po- questions. And the second principle is that any councils or officers of the people must be chosen by lot from among the citizen body rather than being elected. He goes on further and say that states based on elections rather than lot were not democracies. They were either oligarchies or aristocracies. And why was that? It's because the principle of deliberate selection always results in the rule by the wealthier and better educated candidates. Because those who are wealthy and better educated are able to afford the costs of elections and present themselves as more plausible candidates. So, in contrast to that, he said, the distinguishing feature of a democracy is that poor people actually rule the state that the decision-making bodies are proponently made up of poor people. Now let's look at the British experience rather than the USA. Britain's just gone through three years of the worst constitutional crisis since the Home Rule crisis of 1914. And this was triggered by a referendum, the referendum to leave the European Union. This result in a crisis which, if you were to look at the newspaper headlines, were extreme. People were talking about coups. People were talking about the overthrow of democracy. Both sides were talking about the overthrow of democracy. The last occasion um, when anything like this occurred was, as I said, in, in 1914, when the ruling class split over the issue of Irish home rule. And historians speculate that had the the First World War not broken out, it could well have resulted in civil war in Britain because sections of the army were mutiny. It didn't get to that stage, but there was certainly a a crisis of the upper classes in, in Britain over the last three years. It was a complete paralysis of the political system. Nothing could get through Parliament. Parliament was deadlocked. Both the main establishment parties were split. There was no effective parliamentary majority for the government, despite there having been an election in 1917 to try and establish one. And parliamentary rules were being bent or changed to displace centuries-long traditions, um, according to which the government controlled the parliamentary timetable. Instead, people were talking about MPs taking control of of the situation. Now, they were taking control of the situation contrary to what the vote had been. The, The popular vote had been to leave the EU, but this wasn't what the political establishment wanted. The political establishment didn't want Brexit. They were horrified by the result and they didn't know how to act. And they openly conspired to overturn the referendum result and thus to negate democracy. And they did this by using their position in the establishment. Their dominance of parliament, because two-thirds of members of parliament at the start of this were against leaving the EU, and their ability to pay for expensive court cases to bring the Supreme Court, which had recently been invented, in to try and overrule the government. Now, this is another institution, the Supreme Court, is another institution which was imported to Britain from the United States by Tony Blair. And 
it is an, one of the elements of the oligarchic character of the US Constitution that major issues end up being decided by nine judges who are completely divorced from the general population. Now, the, the picture I've got there is of one of the prominent campaigners against the, the popular vote, a, a businesswoman called Gina Miller, who repeatedly paid for court cases to challenge uh, the process of Brexit and try and hold it up. Now, what this revealed was that when the public voted against a policy that the middle and upper classes wanted, the contrast between the oligarchic nature of Parliament and direct democracy was openly revealed. We could see that basically the middle and upper class don't like democracy. The educated classes openly ridiculed the voters as being stupid, prejudiced, unable to decide in their own interest, easily fooled. And these tropes are the long-term aristocratic denigration of democracy. That democracy leads to the masses being misled by demagogues. Uh, the, the next thing that people claimed was that uh, direct voting was only advisory and that the establishment and, and parliament could ignore such a, a direct uh, vote if they wished. Now, you might expect that the left or social democracy would stand up for democratic rights under these circumstances. But that didn't happen. The majority of the Labour Party members were pro-Remain. This despite the fact that 60% of the constituencies held by the Labour Party had voted to leave the EU and that nearly all Labour to Tory marginals were leave voting. Despite this, Blair and his still strong group of supporters in the Labour Party pushed the Labour Party to, to block every step towards Brexit in 2019, to vote down every proposal to actually leave, every proposal to pass a set of uh, laws that would validate leaving the EU. And then they pushed legislation to prevent the government leaving without such laws. The end result of this was a, 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 a constitutional crisis which led to another election and it led to the catastrophic defeat of the Labour Party. The Labour Party had taken a position against a democratic vote and the end result was they substantially lost seats. They lost seats particularly in the areas that had voted to leave. But what's been achieved by that crisis? Well, the important point in the context of the British Constitution, which evolves by precedent, is that a constitutional precedent has now been set that referenda cannot be ignored. Whilst they may in theory be advisory, in practice it's been shown to be politically impossible to override them. The consequences are too severe. Now, if you cast your mind back, historically, in theory... The monarch rules in Britain on the advice of her ministers. So decisions taken by the prime minister are in principle only advisory to the queen. But it was long ago established that the monarch has to take that advice. Now it's been established that although in principle referenda are advisory in Britain... In practice, Parliament has to take it into account. And the next effect has been to move referenda up the agenda. The major issue in British politics now is now whether, is whether there should be a new referendum on Scottish independence. And secondly, questions of classical democracy start to be aired. Just uh, a couple of weeks ago, there was a debate on the BBC as to whether the upper house of parliament should be selected by lot 
in, after the ancient Greek style. Now that kind of issue was not even debated at the time when Alan and I wrote Towards a New Socialism and advocated selection by lot as the representative st- system that you should have. But they're now actually moving to the forefront of debate. Um, you get articles in the leading papers discussing the issue. So these are just some which have appeared. And it's not just a British issue. This is an issue which is coming to the fore in other European countries. If you go right back to 1848, Marx and Engels wrote the first step in the revolution by the working class is to raise the proletariat to the position of ruling class and to win the battle for democracy. There's a painting from 1848 on the left and scenes from 2019 on the right. Not much changes. Massive demonstrations for direct democracy in France over the first half of 2019. Huge crowds taking over the centre of Paris. Now they they were repressed. But in the process, they're reviving old, very old slogans. So this is a, a report in the Daily Express, which is a right-wing newspaper in Britain, describing the positions taken by the yellow vests in France. There they're saying Frexit, that, that is to say France's exit from the EU, would be the precursor to a radical transformation of French politics, allowing ordinary citizens to reclaim politics from a small ruling oligarchy and to have greater influence on the political agenda. Monsieur Grandmal said that he envisaged a large role for direct democracy, the creation of citizens' assemblies in all the country's regions, and the holding of referenda and the adoption of the ancient Greek tradition of sortition. So, these old ideas of democracy are becoming live. What are the lessons we should learn from this? One is that the left has to champion direct democracy. The Labour Party took an elitist stance in Britain and it was defeated. It was shameful that it took an elitist stance. The key principles that we should base ourselves on are support for referenda. We should be advocating direct electronic voting on issues like tax and spend. And we should be advocating the replacement of parliaments by citizens' assemblies chosen by lot.